Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you today another really fascinating guest involved in uh, science and technology that's involved uh, in creating a better tomorrow, ultimately, for all of us. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. David Greer, Professor of Physics and Director of the Center for Soft Matter Research uh, at NYU, uh, where his research focuses on uh, experimental soft condensed matter physics, which is this really fascinating interdisciplinary field that involves physics, chemistry, biology, nanotechnology, uh, ultimately uh, aiming to understand how very simple objects interacting in simple ways organize into really complex and sophisticated uh, hierarchies, uh, both structure and function. Uh, Dr. Greer uh, did his undergraduate degree in physics at Harvard, went on to do his PhD uh, at University of Michigan, and then did two years as a postdoc uh, in condensed matter physics at AT&T Bell Laboratories. Uh, and then went on to accept the position at University of Chicago. There he was a member of the physics department uh, for 12 years, uh, then moved to NYU in 2004 and served as department chair for eight years. And um, during that time, he has achieved numerous laboratory uh, first uh, involving, uh, including things like developing state-of-the-art methods uh, of digital video microscopy, uh, developing these powerful new methods of so-called holographic video microscopy, microscopy, uh, as well as some really science fiction uh, moonshot themes, uh, including the first practical tractor beams, the first knotted force fields, and the first optically organized micro machines. And there, um, via uh, his uh, some really interesting holographic optical trapping techniques, which we'll be talking about, uh, developing tools that really provide groundwork for a range of areas and applications in photonics, medical diagnostics, drug discovery, environmental monitoring. Uh, He's extensively published, um, awarded a lot of really important themes to get into today. We're honored to have with us, um, Dr. David Greer, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today and talk for a little while. So Ira, thank you so much for inviting me in for that like over the top intro. Um, thank you very much. Uh, no, I'm just really excited uh, to have the chance to talk a little bit about the kind of uh, work that, that goes on in my field, because it's not a field that uh, people have heard about, probably, because it's actually very new. It's a, it's an emerging field in, in interdisciplinary scientific research. And I think it's really important to get the word out, because I think when people understand what we're doing, they're going to want to be part of it. Absolutely. I, I want to be part of it. <laughs> so that's why I thought it was so cool when I was reading all about you. And I'm so glad we have the opportunity to do this. Um, I, I'd love to start off, though, you know, as we typically do by by handing you the floor for a little bit. You know, obviously, we're going to be talking a lot about these themes of, of fundamental organizing principles and, you know, how these, you know, simple uh, states lead to really complex states of organization. You know, I took a look back uh, uh, to 1989 to your uh, uh, your PhD, uh, Pattern Formation Far From Equilibrium in the Electrochemical Disposition of Metals. And here, uh, again, you know, the, the theme of uh, form, of structure, function, um, shows up at a very early stage in your work. Uh, here, you know, working with areas like uh, metals, and, and you point out that, you know, even areas like uh, battery production and oil recovery and microelectronics we need to understand these at the uh, uh, the metallic, the alloys, the uh, uh, the different chemicals that go into these products because ultimately, you know, um, they change in structure and, and that changes function. And 
to take us back to 1989, how did you get into this area and, 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 you know, what got you started on this path? Okay. So, you know, scientists, you know, sometimes jump on bandwagons, right? Uh, you know, there, there, there are, uh, there are fads, there are themes, there, there are memes, there are things that, that just catch uh, the, the, the ear of the, of the scientific community. And back then, one of the, the big uh, earworms was, was fractals. Um, everyone was really excited about fractals because it was a comparatively new concept that had emerged from math and was gonna, uh, it had the promise to liberate physics from uh, from the, the bondage of platonic solids, right? Up, up to that point, everything that we had um, been able to talk about quantitatively uh, was based on something really simple, like a cube or a sphere. And there are all these physics jokes like about a, like assuming a spherical cow. And those jokes, you know, actually um, are, are uh, both, uh, both hurtful and a source of pride at the same time, uh, because the um, the spherical cow, you know, is spherical because it, presumably that's all we can calculate. Um, but it um, can also be enlightening because in very, very many systems, that's enough. But even so, it's limiting, right? You, so you're talking about a cylinder, you know, you know, wouldn't it be nice if I could um, talk about the respiration of a tree, taking into account the fact that the tree is branched and and uh, and that that branching clearly is essential to uh, the tree's ability to thrive in its environment. And, and that's what fractals gave us. So fractals said, um, here's a way to uh, to talk quantitatively about the geometry of things that are not orderly, that are disorderly, that are uh, um, you know, maybe uh, maybe not random, you know, maybe organized in a very special way, but not like a platonic solid, not simple. Uh, and and uh, weirdly enough, that turned out to be true. Uh, and it is a very powerful way to look at things. Um, so I went to the University of Michigan because uh, for two reasons. One is I'm an experimenter. Um, and uh, the other was that they were doing fractals. So I thought, OK, this is the one place in the world uh, where I could um, do experimental studies of uh, on fractals, this new emerging thing. And again, I was right. So um, part of that uh, got then folded into a really ancient question, uh, which is, uh, why are snowflakes six-sided? Uh, and you know, this, this is a question that goes all the way back to uh, Johannes Kepler. Um, he he uh, he actually it's sort of a, a weird thing. It's like a 17th century grant proposal um, to uh, to uh, the patron who was funding all of his research um, as a New Year's gift. He he wrote him Kepler wrote a, a book called On um, the Six Sided Snowflake, where he taught, introduces like Kepler's conjecture for how spheres pack. And I bet we're going to get back to that because it's a really powerful idea. The idea that the best way to pack spheres is the way you stack oranges in a supermarket. So, uh, you know, like you make a triangle and you put one in the middle. So uh, Kepler suggested that that's, you know, that's the best way to do things, right? Um, that that you can't pack spheres any tighter than that. And this was, this was a, a breakthrough, a mathematical breakthrough in that day. And then he went on, he said, and if you look at that packing, you see triangles and hexagons. And maybe like if water is spheres, which it's not, but you know, maybe if water is spheres, um, you pack it together, you get all the triangles from that, that packing of spheres. Uh, and that has the six-fold symmetry. So maybe then that gets expressed in the macroscopic six-fold symmetry of a snowflake, right? So the, the, an, the anisotropy, the directionality of that mm -hmm. microscopic packing, maybe it expresses itself macroscopically. And maybe that's why snowflakes are six-sided. And, you know, a few hundred years later, you know, the answer is yes. And uh, my thesis is one of the reasons we know, we know why. Because um, the idea is if you grow things randomly, uh, it turns out you get fractals. So my thesis advisor, uh, Len Sander, actually I had two thesis advisors, a theorist, Len Sander, and an experimenter, Roy Clark. They, they, um, uh, they both uh, set me on my path. Um, Len, Len had uh, realized that if you pack things together randomly, just like let them rain down and find each other and stick, that you get a kind of uh, a kind of fractal that we call diffusion limited aggregation. Like diffusion has to get there. Uh, that's what limits the process, and then you get an aggregate. Uh, that also shows up later um, as one of my uh, my research group's principal industrial applications. Mm -hmm. um, so okay, so so you should get you know if you're growing things like that, you should just get a dust bunny. 
Um, but instead, you know, under some circumstances, you get a snowflake. Um, and so the question is, why sometimes a snowflake and why is a snowflake always that shape? And why other times uh, a random fractal, you know, dust bunny? Uh, and what governs the evolution of morphology? Because yep. presumably those same rules then express themselves again in the structure of a tree, the structure of your lungs, um, you know, all, all of the wonderful you know, neural networks, the, the, the random, the seemingly random structures of nature. So that, that, that was 1989. No, no, it, it, it's perfect. And as you're, you know, um, you know, one of the things you point out uh, sort of when you give a general sort of uh, introduction of what soft condensed matter is, uh, you know, you you give a bunch of examples, um, you know, on this list are, are emulsions, liquid crystals, colloids, gels. Uh, and then you point out sort of the very close connection as you know as we we're just doing uh prior uh between some of these um i guess what they call it sort of non-living but excitable materials that kind of look alive although we know they're not and biology because there's a you know a lot of the complex fluids and systems in living tissues kind of look like <laughs> this stuff talk i mean just start out by giving us a little introduction again to soft condensed matter and I guess some of the different categories that you put these materials in, and then a little later on, we'll get into uh, some of the applications. And and, and uh, but I think it's important to make some of these comparisons between living and non-living because there there's a lot of similarities there. All right, I mean you 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 hit on on so many like critical themes, and 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 as you say, the idea is like you know to tie them all together into one conceptual framework that that gives clarity. So. Um, I guess I guess you know where I'd start is is with the building blocks. I, um, so soft condensed matter physics, as as you as you explained so clearly, is is all about understanding how things come to be organized the way they are, uh, the rules, and, and and the idea is that things are organized the way they are because there are rules. You know there are uh, natural laws. You could people would call them, but I, it's sort of like a, it's a little bit uh, dicey there. Um, but the idea is that there are guiding principles that explain why things turn out the way they do in some sense because they have to because there there aren't really any choices uh things turn out the way they do uh because there are principles that guide them uh they are expressions of those principles so you know let's think about how like we came to be like you and I are and and, and anyone listening is um is uh you know made of biological cells, right? right? Those are the building blocks that make the tissues, that make the organs, that make um, the organism that, that, that we are. Um, those cells, you know, have uh, come into existence, uh, not because people like put the Lego bricks together, um, but because they uh, grew the cells that they needed in order to make the structures uh, that, that, that uh, an organism needs. Those cells themselves are made of molecules, right? Those molecules are not alive. Those molecules are, you know, you can you can have a jar full of those molecules, you can put them together, and interesting things might happen. But it's very, very unlikely um, that the uh, that the the thing would come to life. You know, uh, you know, we don't have Frankenstein yet, uh, and um, not even at the molecular scale. So the question then is, how do those molecules come to inevitably organize themselves? into the structure of a cell, into the three-dimensional, very complex, not orderly at all, but very highly organized um, structures inside a cell. So you have the actin cytoskeleton where the proteins have assembled themselves, the microtubules where the molecules have assembled themselves. And then another theme that you, um, that you uh, pinpointed is um, that some of those molecules uh, have kind of remarkable properties once they're inside a cell. It's like those, uh, there are molecules that can transduce energy from you know, chemical bonds yeah. and turn it into kinetic energy where they walk along. There, there, there are motor proteins that cells use to haul stuff around inside the cell. Um, and so they, they take uh, the products of some chemical reactions and transport them to where those products are needed for some part of the life cycle. 
Um, so we have uh, active processes that transduce energy from one form, like chemist, uh, chemical bonds, uh, into another form, like um, like kinetic energy, or or even into chemical activity. We, you have um, uh, enzymes that that transduce energy and, and use it to um, to uh, push chemical reactions forward that otherwise wouldn't happen. So those things are all organized within the volume of a cell and they've done it themselves, right? N nobody has assembled that cell. The cell has done it itself and it can reproduce that state of organization in its offspring. Um, you know, wow, you know, that's so much better than any um, synthetic technology that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have the the fact that we're talking to each other right now involves a uh, remarkable victories of uh forcing atoms to go where they wouldn't ordinarily want to go right that's you know the computer chips we have in our devices and all the uh all, all the uh, components that are responsible for our communication uh that those atoms would never 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 have spontaneously assembled themselves into the structures of of, of that technology we force them to go there and it's not easy to do. It takes a lot of energy and a lot of information. And that's why fab facilities are like so astonishingly specialized and expensive. Uh, you know, cells do it all the time, everywhere or across the world. And it must be um, under the influence of what I like to call nature's fundamental organizing principles. Right. So those organizing principles are responsible for the organization. And then there are properties that emerge from the organization so that's another theme emergence mm -hmm. um and life is an emergent property of a state of organization of some matter mm -hmm. now that state of organization presumably could exist in other contexts like perhaps even in a computer program um but we don't know how to recognize it yet because we don't know uh, you know fully yet understand how uh how life is an emergent property because we don't yet fully understand from a a mathematical perspective what life is and we're closing in on that like a real rigorous definition of what life is and once we have that then we'll be able to recognize life in other contexts too and perhaps even to um i wouldn't say create life i mean that's you know that's ethically fraught um but you could imagine um using some of those principles to do other things that that we really wish we could do now that are hard to do, including organizing the technology that lets us talk to each other. Right. So that you, you mentioned photonics, that's one of the examples. Right. Uh, so, so right now, if I want to make a photonic circuit element, I have to uh, organize matter at the nanometer scale. Uh, I have to get things right at the nanometer scale, and I have to keep on doing that until I've got my whole device at the centimeter scale. Um, so, you know, that's a... Yeah, so that's a ridiculous number of orders of magnitude of control that you have to have. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're if you're controlling things at the millimeter scale, it's really hard to control things at the kilometer scale too, right? You know, uh, you you don't um, you don't kick a football uh, with with a pair of tweezers, right? right. Um, uh, so uh, so the question then is, you know, but for biology that you know, it's, it happens all the time. You, know, you have nanometer scale processes that control structures on the meter scale, mm -hmm. nine orders of magnitude. Uh, and and it, it goes on all the time. So uh, if we understood those principles, how, how you can control that hierarchy with, uh, with processes that inevitably lead to successful outcomes, then, um, then, you know, what a boon for technology. You, can then synthesize building blocks at the nanometer scale and have them organize themselves mm -hmm. into functional structures you, following the same principles, just using different materials. Yep. So, you know, that, that right there is what we do. No, no, it's, no, it's awesome. And, and I was just, I, I, I'm going to get into some of these really cool tools that you've developed and used to study this phenomenon. I just want to ask you one other thing, if you could just take a couple of minutes, because, you know, we, we, you talked a little bit about, um, biology and you know I, I come out of the life sciences so it, what I just sort of make some of these 
um, parallels. But, you know, in, in my domain right now, we have a genome and, you know, we have a proteome and a transcriptome and all this, these ohm, these, this omics world. Um, and even that really doesn't tell you, again, sort of the, we, we know, that, okay, here's some codes here for making amino acids and proteins, but ultimately how it all comes together to make a, a brain or a heart or whatever. That's much more than just the data that's in the uh, in, in that code. That being said, talk a little bit about the code uh, that 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 you work on because um, it, it's it's much smaller, but it's extremely complex in the sense you know. Uh, and again, I'm going to your website. And I'm just going to pull some of these terms out, but um, things like uh, hydrodynamic reversibility um, and, and how these particles flow in a solution uh jamming it's not about making delicious jams and jellies but <laughs> how many molecules in an emulsion uh they get put in a certain space and so forth all of these concepts whether it's you know reaction diffusion or you know biochemical you know, chemical oscillations they all fit together in some type of sort of almost an atomic genome in a way that that is really your what you're developing i mean at the end of the day you know you're going to be coming up with uh sort of the the genome at the atomic level that describes you know again like in the biologic side you know what the genome does say if you were I mean, without going into all these things because there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle that you're looking at but talk a little bit about that um menu let's say that you're you're looking to create with all these different uh data points sure uh Wow. Okay. So I know so it's kind of a broad reaching question, but I, I really think people should understand uh, sort of the degree of sort of the, the things that you look at here to describe self-organization. But again, what, what a great question though, because um, like just, just picking up on the, on the first um, riff on, on biology, one of the things you touched on was that, you know, it's a complicated thing. You know, yeah. you know, uh, there, there, there are so many molecules uh, interacting in so many different ways um, you know, biology is super complicated if you take it apart and ask what are all the pieces and how do they interact. And um, I think that's actually where the, the physicist's worldview can be useful, can be helpful, um, because it's true. There's complexity. Uh, yeah. Biology uses it. Um, but maybe underlying all that complexity, there are a few simple themes uh, that explain a lot of the behavior. So biology is also incredibly efficient because you know it's evolved in you know a few billion years uh, to make best use of of everything that's available, um, and that includes really simple organizing principles that sort of make things inevitable. And I, I, you know, for like just a like one of the an example that you can really put your hands on. You know, we have the you know this Kepler conjecture, right? You pack. Yeah. You, know, you ask, what's the best way to pack spheres? And you, like like I said, the orange is in the supermarket, and Kepler figured that out. Um, okay, so if I've got things that are all the same, like atoms are all the same, uh, you know, atoms of a given element are all the same. If I've got things that are all the same, and there's some reason why I'm trying to maximize their density, I'm trying to pack them together as closely as possible. Perhaps because they attract each other. Perhaps because you're squeezing on them somehow. Then what are they going to do? Well, when they're far apart, you know, okay, they can do whatever they want to do, and they behave randomly like the atoms in a fluid. Uh, if I increase their concentration of density, uh, now they can't move so freely anymore. They, uh, they, 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 they jam each other up. You know, we're going to come to that. Uh, and uh, the best way they can do that is for everybody to pack together uh, into Kepler's close pack structure. And in fact, that's that's the full explanation for why so many elemental solids take the form of a close uh, close pack crystal, because that's just the best way to pack spheres. And nothing sort of quantum mechanical about it. Um, uh, you know, it's it's you know, in some sense a symmetry of nature uh, in three dimensions. And uh, and uh, so you say, okay, well, what about you know, does that how does that translate if I've got things that are sort of different or if their interactions are more complicated than just, you know, repelling each other when you get too close? Um, well, you know, then you come into the the uh, realm of protein folding, um, where you say, okay, a protein is a long strand molecule. You can think of it as beads on a chain. 
and the beads um, have maybe different sizes and the beads interact with each other in different ways. You know, so so maybe some some kinds of beads, uh, it's energetically beneficial to put them together. Other kinds of beads, nah, they, you know, they, they'd rather be apart. So now you say you take this chain um, and you um, and you let it uh, find its find its way. Let it like uh, use those associations to uh, to pack the things that want to be together and keep the other things apart. And it's got to be democratic, right? Because you know, uh, because uh, you got to listen to everybody's voice in deciding how you're going to be. At the end of that process, you end up with a three dimensional structure, um, which is presumably the best packing of that protein, the best configuration. And what's wild about that is that biology takes advantage of it. Like it says, you know, not so much the chemical sequence, that's, you know, it's not so much chemistry that's uh, that I'm talking about, it's geometry, right? Because this thing is folded up into that wacky shape, whatever it is, now that protein um, ha has the correct three-dimensional form to, um, to perform a task. And some of those tasks are like, okay, catalyze a chemical reaction. That's what we talk about a lot when we're talking about medical application. You know, a, a protein comes in, it binds to another uh, to another chemical binding site uh, because it's the right shape. And now something happens inside the cell as a result, which could be beneficial or detrimental. You know, and, and so if it's beneficial, you want more of that. If it's detrimental, you want to stop it. Uh, and so a lot of a lot of um, the biochemistry that goes into pharmaceuticals is in getting the the geometry right. Yep. Um, so if you understand how proteins fold, then you can uh, use that right away to to create drugs. And yep. the good news is that's um, a problem that is largely effectively solved these days. Um, uh, the, so protein folding, the protein folding problem was a huge challenge uh, in, in many branches of science, including mathematics and, and of course, biology and physics. Uh, because if you just sort of say, how long would it take for um, the protein, the, the, the beads on the chain, the amino acids on the chain of the protein to find themselves in, in the right configuration, right three-dimensional configuration? The answer is, you know, it's, it's a, a fun sort of parlor trick. The answer is many times the age of the universe. Yeah. And yet, Proteins do it in a few milliseconds, so there's got to be a trick, and that trick is maybe just has been discovered um, in in uh, in such a way that it can be implemented in a machine learning uh, platform, so that now you can take an amino acid sequence mm -hmm. and ask the machine learning system what's the uh, what's the best uh, three dimensional configuration for this protein, and it will tell you lickety split. It is a rev. This is brand new stuff. Um, uh, people in uh, soft matter uh, are played a part in that yep. revolution, and it's a real revolution. I mean, the the rate of drug discovery is is vastly accelerated because of this brand new advance. Mm -hmm. So again, you're looking for an organizing principle. Why, you know, how how does the protein find its configuration? Once you've got the answer. Um, you can use it uh, mm -hmm. very beneficially. Yep. So okay. So so you know those are those are simple examples. You sort of say how do things pack together? Um, then you sort of say okay. Uh, once they you know once they've once the unit has its configuration, what can it do? So I'll come back to proteins again, right? You know so so if I take I don't know like a sponge, and I squish one end of the sponge, you know the other end might move a little bit, but not in any particularly interesting way. If I take a pair of scissors, so now now you can imagine a pair of scissors. If I take a pair of scissors and I move the I, I move the two uh, finger holes, then the other end of the scissors uh, will either open or close, right? So mm -hmm. a motion over here leads to a response over there, which of course is technologically useful because it's good to cut things. Um, okay, proteins have that property too. That if um that if I bind something over here to make a small mechanical change in the separation between parts of the protein, that can have a uh, an effect on uh, a big disproportionate even effect on the configuration of the protein elsewhere. So maybe a protein that wouldn't fit all by itself. When I bind another protein, click something changes. Oops, something changes, and now it fits. That's a process called allosteric. So. Mm -hmm. Allosteries uh, is a um, is a property of the mechanical constraints uh, within a 
packed system, and it's not an order, orderly packed system. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell worked out the um, the constraints for like an orderly packed system. He's responsible for the uh, actually for the structure of most bridges these days. Um, most bridges use uh, Maxwell's uh, Maxwell's constraints uh, to make sure that the bridge is uh, rigid and doesn't uh, doesn't uh, become unstable. Um, Maxwell did a lot of things, uh, you know, electromagnetism, uh, statistical physics, thermodynamics, uh, uh, mechanical engineering. He was, you know, a, a, a smart person tends to be smart in many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so now you say, okay, these proteins now can interact with each other to change configurations, to change functionality. So um, can I design that kind of response into a synthetic system that I want to make. And so if you understand the rules that are responsible for, um, for a set of constraints generating this property of Alistairy, then yeah, you can. Yeah, so you have an emergent property, which is Alistairy, which is an emergent property of the, um, of the configuration of interactions within one of these chains. Hey, presto, if you understand the principle, you can, uh, you can make the device. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't have to be just, uh, it doesn't have to be a protein, it doesn't have to be microscopic. You can ha you can um, set this to work to make nanorobots that are sort of like tens of nanometers, hundreds of nanometers. Those nanorobots then could go in to, um, like, uh, to patients and, and perform useful yep. surgeries without requiring big incisions. Yep. So yeah, so so again, th these ideas like, how does it, you know, how does that protein fold up into the right shape. You know, yeah. that question ends up with, you know, ends up spinning out a lot of answers uh, to higher order questions up the ladder of hierarchy from microscopic to macroscopic. Yeah. And the same rules apply at all scales. So we're talking subatomic up to uh, celestial. Um, you know, the same rules apply. So once you've solved one of these problems, you can, you can look for its fingerprint in a whole host of other natural systems. Yep. Before I want to get to some of the other applications, um, you know, like diagnostics and drug discovery and some of the stuff you're talking about. Before we get there, I just want to take. I think this is a good time to sort of do a slight tangential segue uh, into the uh, the tools that uh, you and your team have been involved in developing that uh, you know allow you know not you know not just to to learn about these. Uh, self-organizing principles, but then to do all the other interesting applied stuff that you're uh, involved in. Um, and I, and I, you know, I was joking with you before the show and I'm right, listening, you know, you have some of the coolest sounding uh, tools uh, <laughs> that, that I've heard of uh, as I've been, you know, interacting with great thought leaders. Um, but, you know, things like uh, acoustokinetics and uh, photokinetic phenomena and uh, holographic optical trapping, um, Simplifying it all, you're talking about tractor beams and levitation and force fields using light um, and holograms to move things around that are kind of small, but nonetheless, you know, um, talk a little bit about some of these tools, uh, you know, what are optical tweezers, what, are, what is optical trapping all about, uh, and, you know, take us through sort of these um uh, some of these tools that ultimately, you know, allow you to to learn about the fundamental factors, but also, you know, ultimately apply in a in a variety of of industries. And we'll get into some of the the, of the other practical applications. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna tie it together, right? Because you know we were talking about sort of like ideas in the abstract. We've got these microscopic things that mm -hmm. do interesting things, and we want to understand why the things do the things. Right. Um, now, uh, the objects we're talking about typically are sort of micrometer scale. So mm -hmm. millions of a meter, um, you know, some stuff that fits inside a biological cell. And I, you know, what I really want to do is understand what they think of each other. You know, um, you know, so, so if I put them in proximity to each other, do they exert forces on each other? If so, what's the nature of those forces? How do I control them? Uh, and uh, and so when I got started with my group in this area, uh, those techniques just didn't exist. Um, you could you know, work with things on the millimeter scale. Uh, there were techniques for working with things on the atomic scale, but in between, uh, really wasn't much uh, available. So we needed new techniques. And uh, very fortunately, a, um, a a a colleague from Bell Labs 
uh, named Art Ashkin, uh, who uh, had had discovered like the most wonderful thing. And again, it goes back to to Kepler. Kepler, yeah, you know, like I said, smart people are smart in uh, tend to be smart in many different ways. So uh, Kepler had proposed that um, that Halley's comet has a tail because the light from the sun exerts a force on the dust on the comet, blows the dust out into a tail just exactly the way that the wind would if there were wind, so that the, that the sun's light exerts a force, creates the tail, and lights it up. And he was you know, roughly 50% right. It was just amazing. What a great guess. So um, what Art Ashkin realized is that you can harness that force um, and uh, that you could use that force. You know, you ask how much force does a laser beam exert? Uh, and the answer is like really nothing, not much force at all. Very, very little. It's really hard to measure macroscopically. But on the micrometer scale, ooh, it's just exactly what you need. It's just exactly enough force to get a hold of a thing and to control it uh, with dexterity. So Art was trying to use like counter-propagating laser beams, um, to to exert forces, just like you know Kepler's force on Halley's comet, to exert forces to trap things in three D, and uh, and he had the idea that like well more light means more force. How do I like increase the intensity of the light given that I have the laser that I have? Well, you bring the light to a focus, right? You you focus that light down, so now it's really really bright. So you can use that very very bright light, sort of like a cannon to fire things downstream. And so uh, he tried that out with this material that is the kind of material it's called a colloid. Okay. So colloidal materials are micrometer scale things, particles of one material floating in uh, a sea of something else, like like plastic balls floating in water. Microplastics are colloids. You know, milk is a colloidal material. You know, there are colloids all around us. Uh, and so uh, so so Art took a Art, Art and his colleagues at Bell Labs took uh, colloids, dispersed them in water focused the light onto them with the idea of poo shooting them downstream. And uh, it was apparently like, you know, a mind blowing discovery um, that instead of getting shot downstream, these particles, boom, got stuck in three dimensions near the focal point of the beam, basically mm -hmm. at the. So they, they were expecting to make a cannon. What they got was tum, a trap in three dimensions, one focus beam of light trapped a thing in, in, in 3D. Um, not just in X and Y, but also in Z. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so, you know, Art was a phenomenal scientist. And so he uh, actually sat down and figured out what was going on. Um, and uh, like to make a long story short, the idea is that the um, the, the light's electric field exert, uh, creates a dipole moment, uh, induces a dipole moment in yep. the aluminum object. That dipole moment... Uh, experiences forces in gradients of the light's electric field. So all those gradients point toward the focus. So the induced dipole moment goes to the focus of the uh, of, of the, the the laser beam. But I mean, there's a, there's an, another way to think about it, which will be useful if you want to understand how tractor beams work, which is um, the light carries momentum. In the way it exerts a force is it carries momentum and it transfers that momentum to something that scatters the light. So, so if I've got a focused beam of light, that momentum is going off at some wacky angle relative to the direction of the beam's propagation. If I put a lens in, in that beam of light, that lens can bend the light into the forward direction. Now there's more momentum going downstream than there used to be, right? Because the light was going, was going off in some wacky angle. Now it's going straight down the spout. Um, so, um, so Newton's third law basically tells you that unless there's an external force, actually, I'll say Newton's second law, uh, unless there's an external force acting on the system, the system's momentum has to be conserved. So all there is is the light and the particle. Uh, now there's more momentum downstream than there used to be. So you know momentum has to be conserved. Something has to take up the rest of the momentum. And that's the particle. It recoils. And because you sent more momentum downstream, the particle has to has to recoil upstream. And just you know, for for the benefit of people um, who are not inside my head, uh, I always think of a beam of light as propagating upward. So the beam of light propagates from the bottom to the top. So when I when I when I have my my hands pointing upward, I'm my they're sort of pointing in the direction the light's traveling. 
So then when I when I deflect them to point more upward, I'm saying that there's more light now traveling in the direction of, of the beam, the optical axis. So that means the particle has to recoil the other way. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and so you can turn that whole thing over and and and, uh, and then you can lift the particle up against gravity using uh, using the exact same force. So there are two arguments. They're they're equivalent. There's sort of one organizing principle, uh, and I would say it's conservation of momentum, uh, and that comes from the symmetry of space time, and it's just beautiful. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, one, it's one of those things you can't get away with, get away from if you're uh, living in the universe. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so art discovered this, right? They, they weren't, they hadn't thought, aha, you know, momentum conservation or dipoles experiencing uh, gradient forces. They hadn't been thinking in those lines. They'd just been thinking radiation pressure blows you downstream. More radiation, more radiation means more pressure. So more blowing you downstream. But then when you when you think about it, when you see what happens, and it was a discovery, uh, you can understand it. Great. So one beam of light brought to a focus makes a trap for a microscopic volume of matter. Mind-blowing. That is optical tweezers, and Art got the uh, the Nobel Prize for that in uh, 2018. So, so, so one beam of light uh, makes one trap. That's great, and lots of applications for it. But wouldn't it be nice to have sort of like hands in the microscopic world where you can like reach in and grab lots of things and move them relative to each other. So you can put them in interesting configurations and see how they're gonna behave or so that you could even go further and assemble stuff mm -hmm. on the mic micrometer scale that you wish you had. So um, that needs lots of traps. I mean, ne needs lots of beams of light. Uh, and after a while you realize, okay, I'm directing all these beams of light with pieces of glass on an optical table and it's gonna start getting, and it all has to be aligned to within a gnat's eyelash, so uh, so you're starting to realize, oh man, this is getting this is getting bad. And, and I did mention I'm an experimenter, and so I'm sort of thinking about the possibility of having, like, you know, two traps, no problem, a couple of beam splitters, some mirrors, and and you know, Bob's yarn cool, you're on your way. But if you want to have like a hundred traps or a thousand traps, um, you know, uh, it's just not feasible. How are you going to do it? And you know, the answer is in one word, holograms. Yeah. Uh, because um, because what you can do is use a hologram to uh, to take your one ordinary beam of light and structure it any way you want, including splitting it up into a thousand beams of light, each one uh, traveling its own special direction, uh, each one uh, with its own degree of collimation, and you can direct all those beams of light that you've made with a hologram into the um, input pupil of a decent lens and that lens is going to focus all those beams of light into optical traps and so now instead of having one beam of light make one optical trap you can have one beam of light make as many optical traps as you want and put them in any three three dimensional configuration that you want yep. and here's here's the cool thing um this idea so this this is something that my group invented it's uh, and we called it holographic optical trapping um because we're using holograms to make optical traps uh and uh you can implement this you don't have to implement this with some like very expensive difficult to make microfabricated hologram that you've co computed yeah you can do it with a tv screen so one of our early implementations um we went to best buy and we got a Sony Watchman because that's how long ago it was. Uh, <laughs> and so we bought a Sony Watchman, and we uh, cut the polarizer off. So now you have a um, so now you have uh, a screen that no longer uh, changes the amplitude of the light, you know, like how bright it is, but changes a property called the phase, um, which is in some sense uh, uh, how far the light has had to travel to um, to get from me to you. Uh, so you can put in a phase delay, like a block of glass, which slows the light down, and a thicker block of glass slows it down more than a thin block of glass. And so you can now implement that at each pixel uh, on this um, on this messed up TV set. Mm -hmm. And um, and by doing that, you can say, okay, this is what the TV set does to the light at each pixel. Um, so now I understand that I can use that property, you know, that thing that I can control to implement a hologram that will trans transform my ordinary beam of light into the um, into the pattern of traps that I want downstream. Uh, and so then when I'm done with that pattern, I can show another hologram on the TV set and hey presto, you've got a, a different pattern of traps. Right. And you can do that as fast 
as the TV set can refresh, uh, which, you know, which uh, in those days was 30 frames per second, but you can do thousands of frames per second now. And um, uh, which means that you can have your traps, your, your, your bright spots of light animated in 3D, just the way like a, 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 a cartoon animates, you know, has slightly different photographs. Um, and so you see slightly different uh, transformed images and it gives the impression of smooth motion. Well, you can do that with holograms also. And so you can move these traps around in three dimensions really, really smoothly through space mm -hmm. and time. Uh, and uh, so now you now you have that you have hands in the real world. All you need is a fairly decent computer, but nothing special. You know, so, some you know something that you'd have on your on your desktop, uh, churning out the holograms you need to get the the pattern of traps that you want. And then you can go out and you can fish for particles. You can get all the particles out of the fluid that you're looking for, uh, and then you can put them in any configuration you want, move them around, do experiments. Um, so for the first time, you have full. 3D control in the microscopic world. Yeah. No, it's it, it's incredible, and it, it, it's as you say, it is it is so very cool. Um, you know, as you you know, you define you know these these invisible hands, and, and I have to say, you know, you, you call yourself an experimenter, but you, you're an experimenter, but you're also, and I neglected to mention at the beginning of the show that you're also an entrepreneur <laughs> simultaneously, and you know, you have been involved in translating. Uh, these tools uh, for various applications. Um, and, you know, you, you have a, a company called Spherix that you founded that's involved in using these holograms already for a variety of uh, of quantitative detection. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned things like you know finding protein aggregates uh, and, and, and microplastics in water. You know, there's other applications uh, in terms of uh, cell sorting, um, uh, consumer product looking at adulterants, let's say, in consumer products. One of the the really cool ones. I, there's a presentation you gave a few months ago. Uh, it was entitled um, Holographic Immunoassays Battling COVID-19 with Soft Matter Physics. Uh, and, and this was really neat because, you know, it, it, this was much more than sort of diagnostics. Uh, you sort of like, you know, potentially could, and, and antibodies are so damn complex and, you know, there's so many po possibilities uh, for how they're created, um, you know, antibody deficiency disorders, autoimmune disorders, whatever the case may be. Talk a little bit about, about some of these applications. And then, We'll get into sort of the the connection with machine learning because obviously, as you tweak um, each hologram towards a specific target, obviously you know you have to do it properly. Um, talk a little bit about some of some of this because I think this really shows the um, the diversity uh, of where these again these invisible holographic hands could can go uh, in a variety of things that touch our lives. So, so uh, Ira again. Whew, uh... Rich, rich question. Okay, so um, so so we we have these holographic traps, and we can grab things, we can move them around in three D, but they're kind of they're microscopic, uh, and we're moving them over microscopic distances, you know, hundreds of microns, maybe. Uh, so how do you see what you're doing, right? How do you how do you right. see in three D in real time? Uh, and at, again, at the time, there weren't a lot of options, uh, and so one of the options uh, that we um, uh, that really talented uh, grad student named Sang Yuk Lee came up with was, well, you know, well, why not just record holograms of the things that we're controlling with holograms, right? So, so um, holograms for control, holograms for analysis, and uh, and so we made that work. So the idea is you um, just light up your sample with a laser beam, and that's the only difference from a conventional microscope. A conventional microscope, you know, you light up your sample with the incoherent light from like a light bulb or an LED or something. So here you're illuminating your sample with, with a laser beam. And so if something's in that laser beam and scatters some of that light, um, then the scattered light interferes. It meets up with the rest of the of, of the uh, laser illumination and you get an interference pattern. And, and that typically looks like ripples on a pond, right? Is like this interference pattern. And so you're in a microscope, you're using the microscope to make traps, for example, you're in a microscope. So that interference pattern gets magnified and you record its intensity with a video camera, just an ordinary, like, doesn't even have to be, like, it could be a consumer grade video camera, nothing special. Um, but here's the thing, right? Because you're interfering the scattered light with this reference beam, which is the rest of the illumination, then that intensity pattern that you've recorded is a hologram of the stuff that was in the laser beam. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the laser, like everything that the laser beam has illuminated that has scattered some of the light contributes to this ripply pattern that you um that you record with the video camera. And so so our insight, and again, it was it was kind of a, a, a just like you know, uh this this actually came out of like uh, coffee in the morning, you know, it's sort of like, you know, hey, you know, how, you know, we all the information about the system we're creating, all of that information is encoded in these holograms that we're that we're uh, recording. So you know, let's not just like look at the hologram to sort of sort of get a sense of where things are. Why not analyze it pixel by pixel using um, using the best theories that are available for light scattering and just precisely, precisely, precisely uh, track where the particle is in 3D. That was the first idea. Um, you know, you've got the light scattering theory, use it to see what scattered the light, fit to it, use a generative model. And it turns out that generative model not only tells you where the thing is in X, Y, and Z, and Z was what we were gunning for, right? Because you wanted to see things in 3D, a standard microscope just gives you a thin slab, a laser beam, you know, uh, is, is is as long as you want it to be. And we're seeing everything in the laser beam, so that's great. Um, so we have the huge depth of focus. We have we can go as fast as the camera can go, and all of that 3D information is encoded in the hologram. The wild thing is that that's not all. Uh, so it turns out the same scattering pattern also depends on, for example, how big your thing is. So small things scatter differently from big things, and it depends on what your thing is made of. Um, so uh, there's a property called the the index of refraction, uh, which tells talks about um, how much the material slows light. So um, so vacuum has an index of refraction of one. It doesn't slow light at all. Uh, glass has a refractive index around 1.5. So it slows light by a factor of 1.5. Uh, so different materials have different refractive indexes. So water has a refractive index of like 1.34 um, at in, in the blue. Uh, silica glass is about 1.4. Polystyrene is about 1.6. You know, so so you, you can differentiate different materials by the refractive index. All that information is encoded in these holograms. Mm-hmm. And if you fit it pixel by pixel, fit the recorded hologram to this theory, you get out X, Y, and Z. Great, that's what we wanted. Plus the size of the thing, plus this property, the refractive index, that allows you to say what the thing is made of, um, you know, sort of for free. And it turns out uh, what we discovered was that the fits are ridiculously precise. This isn't sort of like, yeah, you know, back of the envelope, um, get in the ballpark. This is a precision measurement. It's um, And it took us a while to understand why it's so good. Um, it turned out so much better than we thought it would. Um, and and so you're measuring where the thing is with nanometer precision. So I, you know, you've got a micrometer scale thing. Um, you can find out where it is to within the diameter of a few atoms. Just insane. Mm-hmm. And if the thing's a sphere, particularly simple, um, then you can measure its diameter to uh, maybe two nanometers, maybe five nanometers, depending. You know, so so again, you've got uh, a thing that's a thousand nanometers across, and you can measure its diameter with part per thousand precision. Now that nanometer scale, you, you know, you mentioned uh, applications. That nanometer scale is comparable. Uh, well, it's actually smaller than the size of many biomolecules, like um, like uh, antibodies, like like IgG, immunoglobulin G. Mm-hmm. Antibodies are sort of like you know ten or twenty nanometers across, depending on how you're looking at them. So one nanometer precision is actually you know pretty darn good. But we can't see one nanometer things; those are too small. What we can do is we can see micrometer scale things with nanometer precision. So this is so this is what happened when when the um when the pandemic hit uh and there were no tests for covid-19 yeah. uh, uh, and, and everyone you know was was justifiably you know going nuts right like you know we need tests yeah. um so uh so my group realized that we could use this holographic imaging technique to make um molecular binding assays um that don't require any of the usual um, complexity of, of a, a traditional molecular binding assay. So okay. imagine you have one of your micrometer scale beads, you put on its surface things that will selectively bind, for example, an antibody to uh, SARS-CoV-2. 
or will selectively bind one of the proteins from the uh, from the coat of that mm -hmm. virus. Right. So so uh, let's let's start with antibodies because they're easier. Mm -hmm. So, you, you, you know, it's, you've been infected. Um, what do you have? OK, take a blood draw. Um, there are antibodies in your blood. Uh, let's see which antibodies they are. They are. So on the surface, you've got uh, an antigen from SARS-CoV-2. You've got that uh, just you know glued on the surface um, the way biochemists do. Uh, if the antibody sticks to that antigen, hey presto, this antibody uh, code uh, is is programmed already for uh, for that disease. So if you've had COVID, the antibody will stick. Uh, if the antibodies stick to the surface, then the bead gets bigger by an amount that we can measure, and, and we can measure it easily. Ordinarily, what you'd have to do is, you know, okay, the antibody's stuck. Now you have to see if the antibody's there, so you have to fluorescently label the antibody. Yeah. Oh, does the fluorescent label stick to the bead all by itself? So you have to do positive and negative controls uh, just for the detection technique, and developing those controls takes time and money, and the assays are complicated. Here, for us, you just put the beads in with the sample, give it a shake. If the antibody sticks, the beads get bigger, and you can see. Yeah. It was dead simple. Uh, and it works. Uh, and so um, so that that led us to a whole um, uh, library of uh, what, what people call label-free, so no fluorescence, label-free, bead-based molecular binding assays. And and uh, they're being used in research now. The a like actual, like, deployment for medical diagnostics takes time because you have to get FDA approval. So we did all of this stuff on uh, in the early days of the pandemic um, with sort of emergency funding from the government. And, and, and was, I was gonna say, it, it was and, and it was a blast because I'm a physicist, right? Uh, so I don't know um, all that much biochemistry. Uh, and uh, and so it was uh, a great opportunity to sort of uh, quickly form a collaboration with my with my colleagues over in chemistry, my colleagues over in engineering, uh, and then sort so of say, okay, let's get these materials together. Let's like synthesize the beads. Let's you know uh, run run the um, the proof of concept assays. Get that back to the government uh, so that then we can move to phase two and do a uh, you know do roll out something that could be de deployed as a practical test. Mm -hmm. It was you know, imagine uh, from the coming from the world of academic physics, yeah, wow, you know, it's like, what an opportunity to sort of see how the world works. It was fascinating. And, and Dave, let's just say a couple of words, because I know, you know, um, you, you published a few times on um, on sort of machine learning applications that that click together with the, the holographic characterization. And, and there's one uh, uh, on on this uh, catch uh, uh, solution, uh, characterizing tracking collets holographically. Just talk about because you know obviously AI and machine learning are so damn hot nowadays. But the uh, the importance of putting together sort of AI and machine learning systems with something like these these holographic tools, which again hold so much information and and variety <laughs> potentially. Um, say a few words about that too, if you would. So okay, so as, as you mentioned, uh, we we commercialized the the technology for uh, holographic video micro microscopy for characterizing colloidal particles. And that's right. um, that's uh, now all packed up in an instrument by a company called Spherix, which is right. based in New York City. Uh, and, um, and so that kind of industrial application is only possible if the technology is both robust, well, both. It, it has to be robust, it has to be cost-effective, it has to be effective, um, and it has to be fast. Right, because um, because it's gonna it's gonna take a uh, if it takes a long time to do the measurement, then that measurement has to be super valuable for it ever to have uh, an industrial application. Um, so our approach was to to make it fast, 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 uh, so that it could be deployed for everything. Um, so it can be deployed in bulk for medical diagnostics for, uh, so Spherix is, uh, has a, a big application area in biopharmaceutical R&D and manufacturing and point of use quality assurance, because uh, you're looking for particulate contaminants in biopharmaceuticals that could harm patients. So um, you know, that has to be done fast and effectively. So we were looking for, uh, for ways to take our technique and you know, make it meet all of those standards. So mm -hmm. 
let me take you back to when we first uh, did this. Um, so we record the hologram, great. Um, uh, in practice, an, a, a, an experimental hologram doesn't look like like you know a beautiful molecule in 3D or whatever. What it looks like is sandpaper. And there's like something vaguely moving around in the background. It mm -hmm. you know just looks like a disaster. Um, so the so the first thing we had to understand is how is that information encoded in this mess, right? You know where where is the information? And um, the answer uh, is in a, a branch of science called the Lorentz Me theory of light scattering, which was developed in large part by astronomers, um, people who wanted to understand how the light from stars passes through dust fields in order to get to our telescopes and what effect those dust clouds um, have on the light from stars and galaxies and things. Um, so, so they developed this Lorentz Me theory of light scattering. Um, even a seasoned physicist will look at the at the equations that come out of this theory and say, oh no. <laughs> you know, it is it is a rich and uh and just brutally complicated theory. Uh, that involves all sorts of what we call special functions. And special doesn't always mean a treat. Uh, special can mean a special pain. Um, and, and it's not just like these, uh, the, these complicated special functions. It's products of these special functions. And it's not just that. It's the differences in, between the products of the special functions. And it's worse than that. It's the ratios of the differences. And so any little error in calculating these things just propagates and destroys the whole thing. And then to make matters worse, it's not just this mess of math, it's an infinite series of this mess of math. <laughs> um, and so you can calculate it. Uh, the, the first few analyses we did, uh, we, you know, we would get an answer in about a day. So you put in a hologram with a, a, of a particle and you get out the answer about the properties of that particle pretty well, but it would take about a day. So one day per analysis. Um, yeah, you know, so then you work on getting your code more efficient and and putting in what tricks you can think of. And um, and so we got it down from, you know, OK, it's not a day anymore, but an hour, then a minute. Right. You know, you can sort of see like as you as you learn more about the structure of the theory, you can you can leverage that to your advantage. Um, then you sort of get it down to about a second and you say, OK, one second per measurement. Now you're doing pretty well. But it, and, and so you realize it takes one second to calculate this immensely complicated theory. You should be proud of yourself. Uh, you take that same idea and encode it into a machine learning system. Yep. And so now you don't get the answer in a minute or a second. You get the answer in a few milliseconds, a few thousandths of a second. Um, and is the answer as good? No, it's not. It's just totally not as good. Um, you know, it's like 10 times worse, uh, but it's uh, one tenth the time. So you get you get a worse answer in a fraction of the time. And maybe for your application, that's good enough. Maybe you don't need the full part per thousand precision. Maybe you're good with a 1% answer, in which case right. now I've got a 1% answer super fast. Uh, or maybe um, that 1% answer is... A good enough for a starting point, and now you can mm. just refine it using the traditional techniques. So now instead of having to use the traditional techniques to search everywhere exhaustively, which takes time, um, you can start from the neighborhood and just uh, you know you know putt the ball. You don't have to drive the ball; you can just putt it. Um, and so that um, that takes uh, again a whole lot less time. So uh, the machine learning systems just completely revolutionize. Uh, the implementation of these very, very complicated theories uh, by just encapsulating all of that complexity in a system that just um, spits out the answer. It's, it, again, it's it's uh, you know I, I it's a, it's a it's a wild way to implement measurement if you think about it. So like in the past, you know, like the way we use measurement is you sort of say I've got a device that's going to make um, a certain phenomenon accessible to my senses. Great, mm -hmm. like a Right? I, I, you know, I can line things up and 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 now I can measure length. Um, then you have like more complicated things like electrical measurements, where you design a circuit so that if I put a signal into this circuit, you know, maybe some uh, meter changes, and I can read out uh, I can read out the um, number on the meter. So again, all of the transforming the physics of the phenomenon you're interested in 
into the response that you can read was was encoded in circuitry and in, in, in physical phenomena that were going on inside a box, right? Because the circuitry isn't necessarily just an algorithm. The circuitry is itself a physical system that you're driving on uh, with with the phenomenon of interest, and it's you know changing that system somehow so that you get a response you can read. Great. Um, what if that response doesn't have to be like tied to physics, or at least not directly tied to physics? You know, what if you have more of the uh, the Mr. Spock approach, where you sort of eyeball it and get it out to three decimal places? Mm. Yeah, from Star Trek, Mr. Spock. You know, Mr. Sure. Spock, very famously, yep. uh, uh, if you're the right kind of person, um, very famously, uh, <laughs> um, you know, could just eyeball things to you know yeah. to, to ridiculous precision. Um, so you know, it's not necessarily the case that he's doing all of those calculations. It's probably more the case that um, that that complex theory is wired into his neural network as a uh, as a much simpler representation. And um, so we have a super simple representation of the uh, Lorentz Mee theory of light scattering uh, that is. Uh, just exactly what you need to very precisely eyeball light scattering problems. Uh, and wouldn't it be nice to know what, what that system has learned? So we train that system with synthetic data. We use the full theory to generate fake data, synthetic data, um, with a realistic model for the noise and all sorts of all the experimental warts and bells and whistles. Uh, we train it, we train it with synthetic data. Now it it, um, it takes a this immensely complicated theory and it finds a representation for it that's a few hundred kilobytes you know it's it's a ridiculously compact um representation of this very complicated theory wouldn't it be nice to know what it learned so so one of the new frontiers uh in in applying machine learning to measurement theory is to is to train the measurement theory to measure something uh mm -hmm. now that do the measurement sort of like a brain in a box like the mr spock approach uh, now i can do the measurement now the idea is to interrogate that neural network system that machine learning system and extract from it the um simplified approximated uh, idealized uh or optimized maybe a uh, representation of the complex theory because sometimes a complicated theory is only complicated because you're looking at it in the wrong way and if you look at it in another way it becomes simple so we don't know which it is I know we sort of guess that it's sort of that our version is approximated and not as good in some respect but it's you know blazingly fast and totally simple so um it would still be nice to know what it is there's an off chance that what we've discovered is a new way to think about light scattering problems in general wave scattering problems in general and if you uh, when you extract the information from the train network it will provide you with with insights into the structure of that theory, which would be revolutionary. At least it's going to be interesting. Uh, at be, you know, best case scenario, it's um, it opens a whole new door. Well, while we're while we're at that that frontier, um, let, let's let's open a new door now too, because um, you know you've taken us from sort of subatomic, atomic, molecular, macromolecular. We're talking about uh, artificial intelligence and neural networks. Let's talk about um, what uh, soft matter physics uh, and, and this soft matter inside our skulls, uh, what what it, we can potentially learn about that, because clearly, you know, there have been, you know, better than I do, you know, great minds from the world of physics, uh, David Bohm and uh, neuroscientist Carl Brebram that came up with this holographic mind theory some years ago based on you know holography and um love to just get your thoughts on i know obviously consciousness is not just the, the few ounces of stuff inside the skull but much more emergent thing and you know love to just get your thoughts i know this probably isn't the core program of the lab but needless to say um the, the principles that you're studying uh at the subatomic level ultimately translate. So give me a little, a little bit on, you know, where you think your this research is headed in terms of our further understanding of the human mind and where all this stuff sits. So again, I think I think actually, you know, the the emergence of consciousness the uh is is 
right in the wheelhouse of, of soft matter physics. So the center here at NYU, uh, the Center for Soft Matter Physics, there are um, there are 10 faculty members uh, in, just in the center. Uh, one of them, Mark Gershow, is in fact a neural physicist. Uh, he works on neuroscience uh, and, uh, and he is uh, exactly uh, focused on the emergence of computation in biological neural networks. So um, not consciousness he's, uh, per se, but you know, consciousness is um, another emergent property of, of neural networks, just the way that life is uh, an emergent property of an organization of assemblies of molecules um, and could be an emergent property in other systems as well. Uh, some networks of living material um, can process information. So that's neural computation. And some uh, some of example so again that ability to process information is uh, can be viewed as an emergent property and some of the systems that have that emergent property seem to be conscious I mean we seem to be conscious and uh, I will I will grant the two of us consciousness um, so so uh, the question then is how does this organized matter have consciousness as an emergent property um, how does the information get processed. And so that is um, moving from the realm of philosophy uh, into the realm of, of quantitative, of uh, falsifiable uh, physical theory. So uh, we absolutely start to understand now how an individual neuron, how an individual cell, when stimulated by some sort of stimulus, um, has a physical response that transmits information from one place where the where the stimulus occurred to another place where perhaps that that the response can be acted upon right so that's so one of one of the functions of neurons is to be stimulated in one place and to have a response in another place uh in in, in uh spatial and temporal separation uh, so those um those neurons for example could one neuron could be responsible for responding to a smell you know there's something you know it smells like bananas maybe I like bananas um so so I, I uh, there there's some you know amyl acetate or whatever it is that smells like a banana uh lands on this receptor on the surface of the cell that cell now uh now has a response that transmits it turns on an electrical signal down the length of the cell to another place perhaps leading to um uh, the transfer of that information about the presence of the molecule uh, to other cells that might act upon it, that might actually uh, un, uh, implement a an algorithm in the sense of a, a computer algorithm, computational algorithm, to decide what to do with that information in the context of all the other information that's coming in to make a decision to perhaps do something like turn your head right or turn your head left. Now, so, so it turns out that... Um, like neuroscientists, including neurophysicists, including Mark, have um, discovered what some of those algorithms are that are being implemented by these neural networks, like like uh, how the response in the behavior is being calculated, at least for a simple organism like a fruit fly larva or a zebrafish. You know, they're, they're uh, understanding how that stimulus gets processed into behavior. And uh, and a lot of those networks um, are in higher organisms too, like us. Um, you know, so so a lot of the a lot of those processes that that um, allow uh, a, a fruit fly larva to to decide to turn its head left in response to an odor, um, you know, are are in us too, and we're using them to decide things also. The same algorithms to decide things because that motif. Has been uh, that was developed in in these simpler systems uh, have you know the, that motif gets reused again and again and again uh, sometimes in the same context like olfaction and sometimes in completely new contexts uh, you know it just happens to be useful I mean the thing that for whatever reason that's jumping into my head right now is that um, you know all of our information processing all of our motion. You know, all of our actual physical behavior is um, mediated by the energy that cells store in this molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Right. Um, so adenosine, right, is is very close to like what I got here, which is uh, 
coffee with some sugar in it. Uh, so it, now because the adenine on on one end of it is uh, very close to caffeine, uh, that's connected to the phosphate chain by ribose, which is a sugar. Um, so uh, that adenine ribose uh, combination that we use, that our cells use as more or less a storage battery, uh, the energy stored in the phosphate bonds, um, also is used in RNA as a as an information coding uh, 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 technology. So, uh, so the adenosine, this this adenine plus ribose, that um, is is uh, one you know one of the nucleotides that's uh, that's used to make RNA, uh, RNA, which encodes, which is mostly used for transmitting encoded information. Uh, within ourselves, so it's a power. So it's a storage battery. It's an information. Uh, it is, a, you know, one of the four types of information that can be uh, uh, encoded in the sequence of an of an RNA backbone. RNA also folds up just like proteins. Um, it's used as, uh, you know, as um, what is it? Camp uh, cyclic uh, monof uh, adenosine monophosphate yep. is is used as a signaling molecule. Uh, you know, for for neural computation. So the same motif, right, is is used. You know, biology uses it again and again and again in all sorts of different ways, and that goes up the, the ladder of hierarchy to include um, neural circuits that implement particular algorithms that show up um, in one context in the fruit fly, show up in similar contexts apparently in humans, and then also get used in, you know, the same the same cassette of, of capabilities gets used in different ways within humans also, that, you know, maybe ways that the fruit fly doesn't have because it's just not, it doesn't need it because it's not that sophisticated. So consciousness presumably emerges um, from these motifs of computation uh, and I would I don't think that anyone would say that we know how yet, uh, but I think we've come a very long way in understanding what the building blocks are, yeah. uh, you know, what, what's in play here so that we can figure out how it plays. Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, hey, if there's uh, any anyone with the tools to figure this stuff out, uh, you know, you're clearly. Uh, have shown throughout our, our discussion how you know these these principles that ultimately you know go back to what you're all about in terms of soft matter physics. Um, you know they 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 form a, a basis for you know looking at this at a much more detailed level and you know again connecting uh, maybe themes that haven't always talked to one another. Um, but you know I, I'm I'm excited. It's very exciting. Uh, all all these areas from the from the fundamental discovery to the to the applications in biology to to you know i guess what we call more esoteric uh, concepts of, of consciousness but it's really really exciting david um what, what else is coming up that we should know about not that you know I'm enough, but other things on the calendar uh in, in terms of uh, talks you're going to be giving uh, conferences you're going to be presenting at other new areas that the lab's going to be dipping your feet in anything so i missed please so the, uh, okay, so I mean, uh, we mentioned tractor beams. We didn't talk about them. Uh, talk about. Oh, them. I, haven't, I haven't gotten to them yet. I, I'm going to get to them. But yeah. okay, <laughs> gonna, I was going to um, stay so, at the micro level at this point. But go ahead. So so um, meetings that are coming up. Uh, there's an interesting uh, organization that uh, that folks should be aware of uh, called the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, AAAS, and yeah. so the AAAS holds uh, an annual meeting. So this this year's annual meeting is happening in a week uh, in Denver. And what's interesting about this society is that it covers all of all of science. Like there are lots of professional societies that are focused on, um, I don't know, like biology or biophysics right. or um, but this is everything. And it's not just um, academic science, it's academic science, it's industrial science. It's um, it's government, the, the, the government view of science. So you have um, not just national laboratories, but uh, but federal administrators uh, uh, speaking to the community about uh, the, the government's priorities for uh, for scientific research. It has science educators. Um, it has science communicators. Um, you know, it, it really does cover the whole gamut of of all science in our society, science, history, everything. Uh, and uh, and so this is the kind of meeting that um, that um, 
a person who's maybe not even not like a, a practicing scientist, not like actively involved, but is excited about it. This is a meeting that a person can go to. Um, it happens every year. I think uh, next year, I believe, is in Boston. Um, yeah, and it's uh, really interesting, worthwhile. A couple of days of just uh, seeing science from all different angles. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty impressive. Uh, then we have uh, the March meeting of the American Physical Society. So the American Physical Society, for people who aren't necessarily practicing physicists, it's a weird name, right? The Physical Society. It sounds like it sounds like you know we'd be heavy lifters rather Working than. Out, yeah. <laughs> um, um, uh, but this this is the uh, this is the principal organization in the United States for um, physicists uh, to interact with each other to get together. There are a few meetings every year. And the March meeting, which tends to be in March, but is not always, uh, the March meeting uh, focuses on, generally speaking, my area of physics, uh, condensed matter physics, which includes quantum mechanics, as well as biophysics and, and chemical physics and all that, all, you know, this, this sort of general realm of matter doing interesting things. Um, this is this is actually something, it's, it's hard to imagine, it's up to like 15,000 physicists meeting in a convention center with talks going in parallel, like maybe 30 sessions running in parallel, 10 minute talks, half hour talks, a few plenary sessions um, from something like eight in the morning to something like eight at night for an entire, you know, for the better part of a week. It is, uh, it is hard to imagine that such a thing happens. If you go to every session that you can possibly go to, um, by definition, you'll miss 90% of what's going yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, so these these things, uh, these these events are pretty exciting. And again, it is not just um, academic scientists, it's industrial scientists, folks from government labs, uh, folks um, from uh, uh, the huge world of industries that provide instruments and technologies and materials for scientific research. So, um, so you know, these things always have like a huge showcase. Of uh, of all the new technology that you might want to put into your lab if you have the funding to do it, mm -hmm. uh, plus all the, the academic publishers, which is uh, pretty fascinating. All right, let's um, yeah, I, I apologize. Let's come back to uh, to tractor beams, force fields, and levitation now, because um, yeah, I mean you you've you've been describing these at at the micro level. Uh, per what we've been discussing in, in terms of these amazing tools that you've developed, uh, you know, working in the in the area of soft matter physics. Um, I, I've, you know, I've done a couple shows uh, over the last couple of years in the area of uh, uh, directed energy technologies. Um, and, you know, once again, if we, you know, you brought up Mr. Spock before, um, you know, from say like a military application right now, you know, with these technologies in 2024 have gotten pretty good at shooting down swarms of drones. We're, we're not yet at the at the spaceship enterprise phaser level where I could, you know, zap a city or something from <laughs> from up in the atmosphere. That being said, um, you know, not that I want to do any of that, but if, if I gave you a 10 trillion dollars tomorrow, um, you know, what? Where where could I I mean far from putting a, a force field around the planet to deflect asteroids or you know moving a pyramid from Egypt to Miami for a couple of days, you know where do some of these tools go ultimately? Because I mean obviously it's it's science fiction, but nonetheless you've made science fiction real per what you're doing in the lab now. What's the upper limit to some of these stuff? I mean. Because clearly, I'm I'm a child of that of that era as well. I love it all. Take take us down that path too. So, um, yeah, I mean, one of the one of the uh, reasons that scientific research is such a uh, huge enterprise uh, worldwide um, is because of the uh, you know of, of the great value to society that that scientific insights can provide in in terms you know. Of course, the, the 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 philosophical benefit of understanding how the world works that we live in, uh, but also from the practical value of uh, of materials and processes and techniques and instruments that we can provide. And but you know the reality, as you say, is that it's also um, because of the advances in uh, 
in military technology that right. um, that scientific advances can um, can power. And and the movie Oppenheimer is uh, you know a showcase for that, uh, sure. where uh, one of the most esoteric ideas in in the history of science ended up being realized as a as a, a fantastically destructive weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah, so you can think big. Um, in, in my uh, in my field, people think both small, well, I'd say small, mesoscopic and macroscopic. Um, yep. So I think, and, and all, all of those things have value uh, and all those things have applications, including potential military applications. So for example, um, I was part of a collaboration uh, uh, that was funded by DARPA, which is one of the military funding agencies. Yep. It's the it, It's changed names, but it was the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration, and um, our goal was to take a wonderful uh, topological property of light called orbital angular momentum, which I'd be thrilled to talk about, and to use that as the um, basis for a brain scanner um, so that you could uh, detect traumatic brain injuries uh, in in uh, in war fighters without having to bring a, an MRI machine and all the liquid helium that that requires. So you know, could you make sort of like a like a a, a, a device that you could tr um, transport in a jeep or uh, perhaps even just have as a helmet that you would put on a person's head to perform spectroscopy on their brain to determine if their brain is expressing the uh, the chemicals that are a response to brain injury. Yeah. Um, can you detect those? And and so the the short answer is yes. Um, and the uh, the key to that was again something extremely esoteric. Um, so so you might you know people might know that that um, you know light carries momentum. Like it it can exert a force in the direction that it travels. Um, it also has a property called polarization, which is the sort of the direction that the electric field might be oscillating in an electromagnetic wave. So, so in other words, linearly polarized light could be polarized horizontally. So the electric field is pointing like horizontally and is oscillating back and forth horizontally as the beam of light travels toward you. Or the electric field could be oscillating vertically. You know, the, so the electric field could be in the vertical direction as the beam of light propagates toward you. That's just in the nature of light. If you put those two together in the right way, the electric field orbits the axis of propagation um, and that's called circularly polarized light, and it could orbit uh, on, in a right-handed sense or or in a left-handed sense. So you have right circularly polarized light and left circularly polarized light. Great. You might not know that that's a quantum mechanical property of the photons in the light, that mm -hmm. each photon in the light has a property called spin, which is like a kind of angular momentum, a kind of twistiness. Mm -hmm. um, it's a momentum for turning as opposed to a momentum for traveling. And if I light you up with that spin angular momentum of light, well, you know, you can uh, absorb that light and you can absorb, you would absorb that spin also and you'd start to rotating. Nice. But it turns out uh, that's not how it works down in the quantum mechanical realm of a single molecule unfortunately you know if if you happen to be right on resonance and absorb that that photon you'll absorb the spin and that might go into you rotating or it might go into something else that a molecule can do it's not what we wanted what we wanted was to make the whole thing go round and round like like you're on a merry-go-round you wanted to spin the dickens out of the molecule so because a spinning molecule a molecule that's mechanically rotating like that um, develops what's called nuclear hyperpolarization, hot diggity, um, nice. which, which is what you need in order to do an MRI measurement. So the idea cool. is instead of using a big wonking helium-cooled magnet to hyperpolarize these nuclei, we're just going to use a beam of light that makes the molecules spin, and then the molecules um, are going to have this uh, nuclear magnetic moment aligned so that you can do a spectroscopy and see if the person's sick. Um, so Spin angular momentum isn't going to do it for a variety of reasons. So what, you know, are you stuck? And the answer is no. You can use your holograms to structure your light um, so that it has this additional topological property uh, called orbital angular momentum that arises from something called a geometric phase. Now we can unpack that. Um, like if you think about the wavefronts of light, like what light is, like those wavefronts uh, in an in, in ordinary 
a collimated beam of light that's coming straight at you, those wave fronts look like a sheet of paper, right? So here comes the wave, here comes the wave, here comes the wave. And it's just like you're being you're at the beach and you're watching the waves come ashore. So those are the wave fronts of, of the wave. Um, with a hologram, you can take those wave fronts and you can uh, reshape them. For example, to say, okay, now this wave front is not going to be a sheet, it's going to be a helix. Mm -hmm. And I can have, I can have a one fold helix, which is just like a corkscrew, right? I could have I could I could have a one fold helix. Um, I could have a uh, one fold helix one way or one fold helix the other way, or I could have like a two fold helix. That's like DNA. In that case, the structure of the uh, of the wave fronts it's like one of those car parks where you drive up one side and the other people are driving down the other side and you don't see each other for some reason. <laughs> that's because <laughs> yeah. that's a two fold helix. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you can structure the wave fronts of light with a hologram to have a two-fold helix or three-fold, that's like Fusili, or, you know, or like whatever, you, you know, whatever you want, any number you want. So that topological change from being a sheet to being a helix to being an L-fold helix uh, uh, imbues the light with this wild property called orbital angular momentum. It's an angular momentum that is classical, it's completely separate from the spin angular momentum of circular uh, polarized light. You could do it with linearly polarized light. And it has to do with the topological structure of the beam. And if I light you up with a beam of light like this, like we call it a helical beam. If you light, if I light you up with a helical beam, yeah, you know, you might be gathered up where the light is bright, like an optical trap, but you're also going to be driven around uh, by this orbital angular momentum encoded in the geometric phase that I can control with a hologram. So the idea then is you focus the helical light into the person's brain. The helical light makes the molecules spin like all get out. The spinning molecules develop this nuclear hyperpolarization, and you can do spectroscopy without a big magnet. And so, so again, that was a military application right. um, that relied on the topological properties of helical light. You know, it's like, how esoteric is that? Um, but it has real world applications uh, for, you know, making a brain scanner. You know, yeah, so that's um you know an example and again those same topological implications you know topological possibilities that you can put encode into a hologram and therefore realize in a beam of light uh give rise to other technology also so our tractor beams are are, are um beams of light that travel from me to you but they're structured with a, with a hologram so these beams of light don't just look like they're bright in the middle and get dimmer toward the sides and the, as and they travel from me to you. Um, they actually have weird structure. Like they are, uh, they look twisted. They look like um, like the coils of a spring, perhaps. You know, where the bright part doesn't just travel from me to you, it mm -hmm. travels along a twisty, curly path. And you wouldn't think that that was possible, but it is. Uh, so there you go. Um, <laughs> uh, and 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 it twists on its way from me to you along its entire length, however long it is. Uh, and so an object that cares about the brightness of light gets um, trapped on these twisty curly cues. But I can also put this sort of this helical structure into the wave fronts that twists the other way. So now, you know, the, 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 um, the corkscrew of light that's coming from me to you, which again, I mean, it's like the first time you see it, it's, it's mind blowing. Like how can light corkscrew? And yet it can, you know, you figure out how to do it. Um, so the light's corkscrewing to you, but the um, the twist in the light is turning the opposite way. So now you get twisted back up the corkscrew um, by these phase gradient forces encoded in the geometric phase. You get twisted up the corkscrew along the entire length of the beam, which means that this beam of light doesn't push you downstream uh, by uh, conservation of momentum. It pulls you upstream the wrong direction but it's still conserving uh, conserving momentum. Uh, so uh, that's a tractor beam. Uh, and and uh, we were lucky enough to discover the principle behind it first, uh, and uh, some two or 300 years before it was supposed to be invented uh, in the Star Trek universe. So, uh, so uh, we have, a, we have um, optical tractor beams for micrometer scale objects that can pull things upstream uh, along paths of like centimeters and maybe even to meters. Um, we haven't done that yet, but other people claim to have uh, taken our technology and done that. Um, you can make these things really big. You can make kilometer class um, tractor beam modes. And one of the things that uh, that's kicking around at NASA 
is the idea of using these tractor beam modes to um, gather up dust from comet tails. So it all comes back around. We're talking about comet tails again. Okay. Um, so so um, because uh, right now, the way you gather dust samples from comet tails is you take a billion dollar space mission and you uh, pass your vehicle through the dust cloud behind the comet, uh, right. behind the comet's nucleus. Uh, hopefully that's going to be okay, but there's no guarantee. Uh, right. The way to catch the dust is by extending a mechanical arm uh, and um, and using a, a substrate, like actually like sort of like a Kleenex to uh, to mop up the dust as it goes by. But mechanical motion in space is really risky because uh, lubricants tend not to work in space. So there's always a possibility that the arm won't extend. There's a possibility that your your vehicle will encounter something that's much worse than dust and get smashed up. You know, there's a lot of risk in that kind of mission, so you can't do it all the time. If, on the other hand, you could stand off from the comet tail by a kilometer or so and just pull dust in with a tractor beam, um, then you know that's a lot safer. It could be a whole lot more effective. You could also use that same technology on the space station to make a tractor beam that gathers up ice crystals from near Earth orbit, sort of micrometer scale ice crystals. Um, those are cool because they got to us um, by being deposited uh, in orbit by comet tails, passing comets. Mm -hmm. And so those ice crystals, some of them are primordial, right? They come from the uh, from the the time before our solar system had coalesced. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you can you can mine those ice crystals for information about the um, the genesis of our solar system. So there are lots of reasons why you would want to do uh, use uh, these optical tractor beams for uh, for space exploration, which again is I, I think it's super cool, right? That yeah. that, that NASA wants Star Trek tech. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely and again no it's um no it just again it, it points out the uh you know the diversity of uh of opportunities and applications that come out of your work and uh, i missed again i'm i'm a major fan david i i uh just so intrigued uh at, at, again at all levels from the from the subatomic to the cosmic um that you're involved in it's just uh such an amazing um you know career that you need path that you've been on and you know where you've taken it and where you continue to take it not just in the fundamental research but in the applied side um i i i take my hat off to you i i'm, I'm super impressed um probably should do some follow-up episodes to to go you know to, to as you continue to develop these tools um any any final messages for us while we have you i realize i'm taking a lot of your time and you probably got lab folks and students and everything that want to see you but uh, anything that i missed any anything else that uh that, that we didn't touch on that you want to mention while we still have you final messages please uh take the floor on the way out okay so i i would say first and foremost for for young people um this is uh, it's a, a growth time in the sciences there are tons of careers like really good careers uh and uh and i highly recommend if, th if this sort of stuff um appeals to you it, it's a great thing to get on board uh, for people who think, oh, you know, I've started studying something else and and it's too late for me. It's not too late. There are lots and lots of ways uh, to to uh, get on board. Uh, I changed my mind about what I was going to do uh, with my life several times in in uh, from uh, from high school through college on through grad school. I've um, you can change your mind. You can shift gears. I encourage you to do it, and I encourage you to shift gears and come on board. Uh, uh, where I am, because the as I say, the you know the water's great. Um, for uh, for people who are in the middle of their careers and reckon, oh, you know, well, you know, this this is what life is. Again, there are lots and lots of opportunities uh, to to uh, you know to be uh, a practicing scientist, to be a citizen scientist, to be a partner of science. Uh, all sorts of ways to do that. Uh, and again, if you're uh, from the New York region. Um, if you want me to put a plug out to um, one opportunity that I highly encourage everyone to get involved with, there's the Billion Oyster Project, uh, which uh, whose goal is to repopulate um, the oyster beds of New York Harbor because nice. oysters are filter feeders. Uh, and uh, and before the uh, the ecosystem got destroyed in the harbor, uh, the oysters in the harbor entirely filtered 
all of the water in the harbor once every three days. <laughs> Let that sink in. Uh, the the uh, the water was clean enough and oxygenated oxygenated enough that sharks could swim up the Hudson as far as Albany. Um, <laughs> the idea the idea is to um, is to repopulate those oyster beds um, so that uh, so that we can uh, accrue all the benefits of having the oysters cleaning our our um, environment for us. Uh, they also make fantastic. Uh, tide breaks for um, for remediation against global climate change, against the storm surges that will be coming. Uh, there is There are opportunities to be uh, involved in the field, to do scientific research, um, to uh, get uh, students involved from middle school and high school. Um, it's just a bonanza, billion oyster project, totally cool. Very cool. Very cool. I'm a big fan of oysters myself. So not a... <laughs> yeah, these, these aren't these. I, I can't emphasize enough. These are not for eating, right? These are for. No, no I get it. I, I I get it. But yeah, no, the uh, it, it comes back to you know sort of the the biomimicry uh, concepts that you know, nature has created these awesome tools that uh, you know we don't always have to recreate the wheel. So you know sometimes yeah you know, evolution has done a really damn good job with them and you know, let's let's put them to work. I mean, my, my, group, my group is, is involved with the Billion Oyster Project through this company we started, Spherix, yep. because the holographic particle characterization right. uh, yeah. instruments, just exactly what you need to um, uh, to study microplastics in the environment uh, and to differentiate microplastics from silt and bacteria and all the other things that are floating around um, so, uh, so that you can assess what the oysters are doing uh, to improve the environment. Like and and to so you can figure out exactly how it is they're doing it. Like where you know where does all the stuff go, um, that they are done processing, and uh, and so yeah. So we're involved with that part of the research effort. Awesome. Really great. Love to have you, David. Um, looking forward to do a follow up uh, right. again for everybody that's going to be listening uh, to this particular episode of the show uh, across the various podcast networks or uh, watching on our YouTube channel. Uh, again, you've been spending time with the amazing Dr. David Greer, professor of physics and director of the Center for Soft Matter Research at NYU. Uh, he is also the uh, ch chair, scientific advisory board member, founder, and Number of the board of directors of Spherix. Check out their company and everything cool going on there with regard to the, the practical application of these tools. Um, David, again, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us, educate us on all these themes. Obviously, thank you for everything you do. And as we like to say here on our show, you know, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for all of us, be the type of work you're involved in. Really amazing story. Well, Ira, thank you so much for having me. And uh more to the point, though, thank you for getting the word out. Um, the the more uh, people hear about what's going on in the scientific enterprise, uh, the better. Great having you. Be well. <laughs>